Alrighty, so binding business data to Vardin components and Vardin applications in general, um, that's another half of Vardin development. I would like to get back to the point where there were new people uh, working with Vardin and then experts working with Vardin with many years of experience. Very quick initial question. How many of you will say that you are binding your business data with getters and setters? One guy, two guys. With getters and setters in terms of UI, so that you have your text field, which caption is name, and you have your, um, let's say, date picker, which caption is birth date, and then you get your data and you say set value, get value, is this familiar? What other options are there? Exactly, how many of you are using properties? Yay, we have not done what in training for nothing then. People have really learned. Uh, when I started in the company almost eight years ago, I had no clue about properties. It was so somehow complex, somehow I didn't get it that there is some kind of method property that magically invokes the getters and setters from my DTO or my POCHO that then fills the values from the fields. Although that is the recommended best practice how to do data binding with Vardin. And I will cover that together with Vardin containers and also with little point from the architectural side how to build such kind of UIs that read only the necessary parts of data from the back end, deliver that to the UI, and bind that data in terms of beans into your components without having to have all the entity model problems brought to your UI layer that Peter was talking about. So let's go there just in a moment. We will start with the application architecture, uh, not as thoroughly as Peter explained it, but just in terms of our example application. Uh, we will talk about the data transfer, how to get the backend data to your UI uh, with, for example, the DTOs, as Peter mentioned. Then we cover the Vardin containers, uh, what kind of tips and tricks there are for fetching only, let's say, some cursor of data with some sliding window approach. You have, for example, one million records in your database, you don't want to read them all at once to your each user's UI, how we can fix that. And then, of course, last but not least, the Vardin fields, so how to do data binding properly. Starting with the <clears throat> architecture and with the deployment, this is about the deployment of the example application, but it's very relevant uh, as quite often Vardin applications, especially the ones that I've seen, follow somehow typically the same patterns where we have separated UI from separated backend. Sometimes they are within the same server, but still they are completely separate modules that should not know about each other. Um, pretty common way to do this sort of segregation is that there is something common in between, something that both modules know, something that contains the objects, the classes that do the actual data uh, transfer. Within the backend side, we can have things like our, well, services. Peter was talking about the classic layered service architecture, although I'm not sure if he was saying very nice things about it. I still consider that approach very uh, commonly used and a recommended way of building um, applications even today. So within my example application, there is the backend module that represents the backend, the data, the business logic of the application that resides within a backend server. Um, this one will contain, for example, the entities which make up the actual application uh, business model. Uh, it will contain services, things that are able to modify this data at database level um, to generate DTOs from the data. We will cover all this just in a moment, as well as then a specific service implementations for uh, things that are very um, sort of business-centric in, in terms of 
Well, in my case, there is a customer service that is able to uh, handle customer invoices, see how many items a customer has purchased with what kind of invoices, um, what the customer address is, all these kind of things bound into a service level that then makes it possible to transfer only the bits and pieces of that data to my UI. So this is the stuff that is, is within, within the backend. Um, within the comments module, we then have things called um, the actual DTOs. Um, there has been, and I think even sometimes today, is still a misconception of one-to-one -one relation between entity and DTO. There's been projects where people have made customer entity and customer DTO, and invoice entity and invoice DTO, and that doesn't make much sense. Uh, instead, what should be done is that we make the DTOs per views, because DTO's purpose is to transfer data, and the view is the one that visualizes the data, then we're going to have to make our DTOs correspond the needs of the view, what kind of data we want to visualize there. So instead, we can make a customer invoice DTO that, for example, combines the customer with some invoice data. We can make a customer listing DTO that can be used to list various customer attributes in a listing type of manner. Uh, or we can make customer edit DTOs, which are purely for saving data from our UI to the backend. So it's just means of transferring data back and forth from the backend server and to the UI. And then finally, we have our UI module that we already a little bit looked in in my previous talk. Uh, it's been categorized to contain the basics, so the UI primitive things, uh, all the navigator stuff that I was talking about within its navigation module, the main menu stuff, uh, and then for each view we have a package that contains the view specifics. That's pretty natural layout for the uh, <coughs> sort of UI project. Um, Deployment-wise, at the top closest to the user, we have our UI module with the views, with everything there is within the UI package that you saw, we have the comments module that has DTOs, data transfer objects, the services that are the service interfaces that we access from the UI. We don't access directly entity services. Well, as Peter said, in some cases it makes perfect sense, sometimes it doesn't if, for example, the entities are of such sort that they can't be transferred over the wire, if they are uh, somehow so bound to each other that you are not able to access referenced properties from the entities. Instead, you might want to compose a DTO that contains just the referenced properties that you needed. Um, we have the backend that has the entity services, maybe very close to the persistence layer database, for example, JPA kind of Java persistence API access. And then we have the actual implementations of the interfaces that are in the comments module. So this kind of uh, layered architecture is rather common with Vardin projects. Are you currently using something like this in your own projects? Random people nodding, yeah. So at least this is a very well-known approach in Vardin world. Um, application layers starting from client browser, uh, represent the same kind of deployment manner as, as the previous uh, example, but with more close to the classes that are living within our uh, own project here. So the views in the UI service, uh, entity services, uh, persistence unit, but with the distinction that the server border goes here. So these things live within the UI server, this is of course the client browser, and these live in the backend server. So we usually tend to write all the business logic within the backend that would then allow cleaner separation of concerns. I remember a project once where there was a major issue with UI server being constantly uh, stressed out and it turned out that the UI server is actually doing the heavy lifting of the backend. So within the backend server, there was only data persistency, but all these logical business logic 
parts were actually implemented within the layer that was deployed to UI server. So this kind of clear separation between these two is something that is quite often a good practice to follow. Um, are you familiar with JPA, Java Persistence API? Some people are. Um, JPA is a way to map database tables into Java classes. Uh, let's say we have, again, our beloved customer entity. He might have first name, last name, some address, some invoices. Invoices are in their own table, customers are in their own table. The way how these things are linked in relational database is what JPA gives us um, by its specification. And how we can access the JPA effectively is through uh, EJBs, um, Enterprise Java Beans. Enterprise Java Beans are like CDI beans, but they live in a different container. They are beans that are governed by their own container so that you can have beans which are stateless, which are stateful, which are singleton, and the container will always give the invoker, for example, in uh, case of stateless beans, a fresh bean instance, so you don't have to concern about any concurrency issues at the same time as the, its container's responsibility to um, give you the actual implementation that will then implement your interface. Anyhow, this entity service right here is annotated with local, so it's an EJB annotation that defines that it's a local service bean interface. And with local, it means that it's deployed to the same server where its intended invoker is. And we're giving some very basic API here, ability to store an entity that is an implementation of abstract entity, and we are also getting a method that will give us back a list of all the uh, entities of given type. And uh, apparently there's some... Okay, never mind. Yeah, that's, that's cool. Um, then there are a few other things. So we can, for example, get the entity by uh, entity ID. So once we know that some item is stored in the database with some ID, and we know its type, we can just acquire the item with its ID. And for lazy loading purposes, we have a way to get the sliding window, the paged content of entities. So we can pass the entity type, start index, number of items, and then, for example, possible sorting properties, which then make it possible to um, sort with database layer queries our data, rather than passing everything to UI and then within the UI server starting to do the sorting with, with Java code. This is really common kind of entity service. Uh, DTO service is something that could be remote or could be local, depending on your deployment. Uh, it's mainly exactly the same as entity service, but with the distinction that we are talking about DTOs. And DTOs don't necessarily have to be one-to-one -one with the entities, but rather they are, as I said, uh, based on the use case, based on the need of the view, what kind of things we have in the view that we want to display in our uh, Vardin fields with the properties. These things should then be mapped directly to the actual DTOs. Uh, because Vardin has its container model, the container is the thing that you bind to your table, to your grid, that you then scroll up and down. That container needs to know the amount of data there is within the backend. So that's why we are providing a way to count the number of data in our specific uh, DTO use case, for example. And of course, then we can get the DTO by ID and we can store the DTO, which will then internally invoke the corresponding entity service uh, provided interface. The implementation would then be something general. So DTO service bean, which is annotated with stateless. So stateless is another of these EJB annotations that just tell that if there are multiple concurrent invocations into a service interface that is implemented by this kind of bean, these concurrent invocations are served by different instances of this bean, so that the life cycle of the bean is only from the invocation to its end, after which the bean is disposed, and a new instance which is governed by the container, is given for next invoker 
So these are very lightweight beans that are very easy to access from the UI layer. Um, with this, we can then implement as many um, EJB interfaces called bean views, which are then a way to access the methods from various interfaces. And with EJBs, it's of course very easy to integrate to JPA, to Java Persistence API, so that we can just pass our entity manager that directly talks with our database to our services. And this, for example, gives us great benefits with transactional transactionality support. Mm, because of this, because of the direct access to database from this bean level, it's common to have the separation between the backend and the UI server because we don't want to, in many cases, allow our UI to access the entity manager. This was, for example, one of the shortcomings of VAD in JPA container. Has any one of you used VAD in JPA container? Did you like it? Mm -hmm. Maybe, yeah, no, maybe, huh? Yeah, well, it really had the problem that your deployment became very difficult. You had to deploy your UI to the same server with the backend to be able to talk with the database. And that's not very um, recommended approach, at least in a bigger scale applications. So data transfer, DTOs, data transfer objects. Uh, it's a POCHO, plain old Java object, built by the DTO service. Uh, it contains minimal on-demand data. So the data that the view happens to need in this particular situation can be wrapped into a DTO provided to you by the DTO service from the backend. And one of the biggest advantages of the DTO approach is that it's mainly completely free from entity model changes. So from your UI point of view, you don't have to change your code if your backend entity model changes, because the getters and setters of your DTO will remain the same from UI point of view. Only thing that would change is the logic within the backend that builds your DTO. But this way you can completely isolate these two systems from one another. The common uh, problem with passing entities directly to your UI without DTOs is the lazy loading problem where the entity in JPA world becomes detached from the entity manager after you have acquired that. And if you then invoke some getter from a detached entity that would reference another property, let's say in another database table, for example, you would always get a lazy loading exception um, as the entity itself is already detached from its entity manager. Um, with DTOs, we don't have this problem because at the time when we are building the DTO, we can very effectively query for all the properties from our various entities as that one invocation to our backend EJB service is allowed to access the entire persistence unit, all the properties, all the classes, all the database tables that it needs. So we can safely build the DTO, we can safely transfer it with the minimal set of data without any concerns of the entity level lazy loading requirements. Then we might wonder about the actual conversion. Um, the conversion in, in, in case of, of between entity and DTO. So not one on one, but more, why, more like with the terms of the UI. So UI needs DTOs, backend knows about the entities. Uh, converter should be a logical piece of code that is per DTO that might have some knowledge on how to build the DTO from the underlying entity model. This is an interface that describes entity to DTO converter. We can convert to DTO from an abstract entity and we get back some kind of abstract DTO with identity. Um, why are we concerned about identity? Have you tried adding items to Vardin container uh, so that you give your own item IDs? Let's say you have Vardin container, you say add item and for example string A. That one goes in fine, then you add another item with item ID string A. What will then happen? What will you get back? Um, on, on what in container level you actually get back null because there is already an item with that same ID. And the problem is that 
if we have multiple items with same IDs, we lose the identity of the item. We don't, uh, we're not able to tell from one item to another if they would have the same item ID, so the container won't allow us to put many items there. So quite often it's reasonable to have some kind of DTO abstraction that internally governs the identity of the DTO. And quite often this is done with uh, UUIDs. UUIDs are unique identifiers which um, are auto-generated, they are guaranteed to be unique within the JVM, and practically they are a very safe way to get ID for DTO if it represents some kind of composition of entities which is not yet stored in the database. Because once it is stored in the database, you of course get the database IDs, then you don't have a problem. But while you have some kind of data item that is not yet stored, you still need some kind of way to implement the equals and hash code for that. And for doing that, the uh, UUID kind of approach as the identity of a DTO is quite common. That is also uh, visualized in the example application. Then DTO to entity converter is for saving purposes. We have some data coming from the UI. We want to store that into our entity model. We have some kind of converter that is able to read the data from our DTO fetch all the corresponding required entities, store the data into them, and then further pass the entities into the underlying service layer that will then, for example with JPA, persist them into database within one uh, business transaction. So these two things are just simple interfaces with case-by-case uh, -case implementation on class level on need basis depending on what kind of DTOs you have in your application. How would you find a converter when you store something? Well, you could think of having a map of DTO to converter. Then you have a couple hundred converters and you have very long map. And then somebody tells you that you should follow some object-oriented principles like open closed principle that says that class should be open for extension but closed for change. So you don't always want to change your existing code when you add new things. You would just like to add new things. We already use dependency injection, CDI, Spring, all that stuff. They have a great way of finding instances at runtime. This is maybe slightly off topic from Vardin, but I'll just very briefly tell you about this as this is very cool feature of the DI frameworks in my opinion. Um, we can make our own annotation, DTO type, and we annotate that with qualifier annotation that makes this annotation a qualifying annotation for determining what kind of an instance we're looking into. And we can pass it some kind of DTO uh, as a value. DTO with identity, without identity, just a way to tell that this kind of annotation concerns this kind of uh, DTO values. We might implement our customer entity to customer listing DTO converter that implements entity to DTO converter, and we can annotate that with DTO type customer listing DTO. Okay, that's a lot of code. What does that mean? It means that when we have the use case that our UI would like to get a listing of possible customer DTOs into a database table, we don't want to fetch all the possible data, so we have composed a DTO called customer listing DTO. And this converter is responsible for producing customer listing DTOs from customer entities and possible other reference, uh, referenced entities. So all the logic of that goes into this little, uh, in, into this little method, and the whole class in itself is this. Um, only speciality is that it's annotated with DTO type, customer listing DTO. What you do is that you make these kind of converters, you pass them into your uh, deployment, they live there, they don't have to know anything about each other, anything about anything else. Only thing they know is that they know about the entities, they know about the entity model. We could then make something called DTO type annotation literal. This is a bit of syntactic sugar. You don't have to really care about that. But it's just a way to get an object reference into Java annotation. This is like Java uh, code level way to 
access annotations on runtime. So it's just sugar. Um, the actual implementation that then finds our entity DTO converter would use CDI's instance of entity to DTO converter, would select with the DTO type annotation literal and with the past DTO type. And the instance itself has two additional methods for checking whether there are multiple implementations of the same converter or a class that has the same DTO type annotation for the same DTO type, which would be a problem, because then we wouldn't be able to decide which one we want, or whether we don't have such kind of implementation at all. If neither of these cases happen, then we are happy to return our invoker, the actual converter. And with that approach, we have now completely shielded our code base from changes when we add new kind of DTOs or new kind of converters, because we can just define new DTO, new converter, and throw them into our deployment, it will work out of the box with the dependency injection mechanism through this runtime instance selection. Um, DTO service plus converter means that no need to change the code. You can add new converters uh, for new DTO types or any kind of converters in general, and they are available through the bean discovery. And with that, UI doesn't have to know anything about this. Only thing he cares is that he has DTO service. He can say that, get me a DTO of this type, and the backend will then do all the heavy lifting. We'll find the converter, we'll know the entity model, we'll build up the DTO from the data that's available, and then we'll just simply return that to the UI. How would we use this? Um, let's have a look at our little piece of example app right here. Um, and then let's go here. So this means that we will first close some little other tabs and, for example, go into the customer view. Um, so this is just a menu item in our cool responsive menu that looks the same in iPad and whatever, uh, with customer URI fragment showing us a table that lists some customer data. Um, if we... Uh-oh. Pro. If we go have a look at the database, we have a dev date table, and there is a little entity model that has customers, has products, invoices, invoice rows, addresses, that kind of, of basic data. And there are some customers within our database table, so we don't want to load all of these into our UI session. Uh, this is important because if you consider, as I said, that each of these browser tabs is a separate UI instance, each of them has views. The view has the table or grid component. If you put in in-memory container that loads all the data from database per each user into the container, you are going to run out of memory almost immediately because you don't want to load all the data at the same time. Um, what we're doing instead is that we're using lazy loading with varding containers. So this makes it possible for me to scroll down this thing right here. And within my Eclipse, there are uh, queries sent to database with this sliding window um, interval. So whenever I need more data, it will fetch the data once I need it. But on the client side, Vardin cleverly hides this functionality that it seems like an infinite scrolling. Um, how that can work, of course, with Vardin containers, the regular data binding is that we have a container, uh, which is sort of the set of data. We have item, which corresponds to one row, and we have a property that corresponds to one cell within the row. Uh, the in-memory containers, which are considered okay for a small amount of data, or let's say a controlled amount of data where you manually do the cleaning of items, adding new items, they are perfectly fine, but for loading large amounts of data lazily, you don't really want to use uh, in-memory containers. So the very most basic container is the indexed container. Then we have hierarchical container, which allows just hierarchical set of indexed data. And we have a bean item container, which is able to uh, automatically associate the type of the item into the item's properties so that it's 
capable of fetching the property values from the item automatically for your table without you having to write any kind of logic for that. Um, there are two sides of lazy loading. There is lazy loading that occurs within the browser. We have our browser where we have our grid and we scroll down. And let's say that we are able to show 100 lines of data with our device size. Um, we have our container, which is in our server-side UI. And we have our database with, for example, those 1 million records. When I say there are two sides of lazy loading, one side is um, how much do we send data from server-side UI to our browser. This means that whenever we scroll down, there is an HTTP request that is responded by an HTTP response. And this matters uh, regarding the size of the request, how much there is inbound and outbound web traffic from your web server to your client browser. It's going on between here. Between here, we have the other side of lazy loading, which is how much data we load from database into our container. And as I said, if we have in-memory container and we fetch all the data per every user, every view, every time, we are using tremendous amount of server memory for maintaining database entries that should be held in database in our Vaadin in-memory containers. This um, loading of data into your browser is handled by the framework, but this side you'll have to handle by yourself. And that's what you do with lazy loading containers. Um, there is an add-on in Vaadin directory called lazy query container. Are you familiar with that? Some people are smiling. Interesting. Is it a good sign? Uh, is somebody very disappointed with this kind of container? Nobody dares to admit. Um, it's an add-on. It's not implemented by uh, anyone working at Vaadin, but another Finnish guy working for a big IT company. Um, it's one of the most used lazy loading solutions for Vaadin that doesn't involve any other Vaadin add-ons or libraries. Um, it allows you to retrieve data by index, and it will not uh, expose the backend assets, meaning that you don't have to expose the entity model. It can work over the DTOs um, on the container query level. How, do, how would you use that is that we have a grid, which is just our table, and we have our lazy query container implementation with some kind of query factory. This is, in my opinion, a bit overhead. We don't necessarily need query factory. We just need a way to make a query that is capable of accessing the database, uh, sorry, the uh, service DTO layer. Um, we have our some kind of identity, so primary key property or identity property. And we have the batch size, which is how many items will it fetch per one request. And then we're using this as the container's data source. Um, the lazy DTO query uh, visualized in our example application uh, is extended from abstract bean query so that it's generically typed uh, to the actual DTO type. Um, we are giving our DTO service, so the service that was completely, uh, let's say, unaware of various DTO types. It's just a service that is stateless, that can be invoked, uh, that will automatically discover you the converter from entity model to DTO model. Um, and it has the general API that was visualized initially. So we're invoking the get page DTOs of the specific type from start index and number of items. Uh, these two properties are coming from the lazy query container itself. So when you scroll down your Vaadin table, it internally, of course, knows at which position the sliding window currently is, and it's passing these items as parameters here, which you then only forward to your DTO service. And in addition, if the uh, table or grid is set to support, for example, sorting, you get also the uh, property IDs which are used for sorting, as well as their sort states, so whether they are ascending or descending. All this information can be passed into your backend. And back, you will get a list of DTOs. And this list, of course, now uh, corresponds to the set of items within the sliding window. And as I said, the containers need to know the number of items in total, mainly to be able to show you the correct uh, height for the scroll bar. So for that, we are also implementing the size uh, method that directly invokes the get count from the uh, DTO service. And if we 
very quickly look at that from the um, code point of view. We have a data table that is then bundled with a little extension, lazy data table. Um, you really get this from the um, uh, from the uh, example application. So it's behaving exactly as I told you. We have the query factory. We have a way to uh, sort of build container for our data table. And internally, we are extending from uh, a data table class that is practically a grid and some type of container. Uh, in lazy case, we are using the uh, lazy query container. Then doing some basic VOD in layouting for setting up the grid, showing it in the full size, setting it as the composition root of this uh, component composition. And in the end, if we go, for example, to customer uh, view bean, we can have our customer service, which is just a DTO service injected with an EJB annotation, because we are in a CDI-enabled view. This is a CDI-enabled bean. Then these annotations are processed by the uh, CDI container, allowing us to get a reference to the DTO service. Then we have our Vardin lazy data table component, which is featured in this example application. And only thing we'll have to do to make some use of it is that we have a customer listing DTO. That is the type parameter of the lazy DTO table, but also the given class parameter so that we can actually know the DTO type on the table level. Then we had the query factory, which we managed to uh, reduce out with Java 8 Lambda. So this is actually the factory implementation that only will make a DTO query from the given definition for the listing type. Uh, then it will pass the actual DTO service as well as the definition that contains the sort properties and the sorting states, all that stuff. Um, and with that, and with nothing else actually, we can um, just get the data from the database with DTOs that is then shown here. And if we look at the customer listing DTO, it practically has three fields, first name, last name, and birth date. And just for the sake of example, I uh, added one feature where you can define a table column annotation on DTO level. So from this class of customer listing DTO, the lazy data table is able to deduce the um, headers of the columns. So given this DTO with these annotations, and with a converter that is able to build up this DTO from the uh, backend entity model, I don't really have to touch any place in my code. I can just make new views, new DTOs, and fetch lazily whatever data I like into my um, actual UI. Time seems to be flying, but we still have what in fields. I think I can take this in three minutes. Um, there are some examples of fields. So all kinds of data components that are capable of data binding are called fields in Varin. They implement the field interface. Um, they can set and get value, but of course they also are bound with the actual properties. So being able to bind a field into a property is their purpose. It's their reason for being in the framework. Um, and also more importantly, with fields you can group properties into items so that you give an item with various properties into a field group. The field group is then able to fetch the properties from the given DTO and bind a property per, for example, one field within your editor component or however you like to see it. So if you, for example, have a person class with name and age and with the getters and setters, we could write, for example, a bean item of person with the person instance. And what would we get is automatic mapping of data that would invoke the getters and setters automatically once we have bound this bean item into, for example, a Vardin field group that is able to bind individual properties into different Vardin fields. So we could make a simple component that has a text field for first or text field for name, and then we would have another field for age property, and these two together with the bean item would automatically invoke getters and setters 
from the uh, person object without you having to write code where you say that person get name, name field, set value, person's name, blah, blah. Um, with very little code, with bean items, for example, you are able to do all the data binding without you having to write a single getter and setter. So it's definitely the way to go with, with Vardin. Finally, one last thing that uh, fields lets you do is buffering. Are you familiar with the concept of buffering in Vardin? Buffering means separation of field value from property value. So field value is the value that you see in your UI, in your text field. And the property value is the value that you can acquire from your getter, from your person item. Um, why would you want to do that? Well, let's go there shortly. Um, how you use that is more to the point uh, of setting a property data source per field. So uh, this is something that the field group does for you automatically when you do the field binding, but with the idea that a field can be bound with a property data source, meaning that the field value is separated from the corresponding property value. Uh, you can set it to the buffered or unbuffered mode, and once it is in buffered mode, you can commit and discard. So this is the purpose of the buffering. You have some kind of a form where you have some kind of data. Maybe it extends for a couple of steps in some kind of, of UI wizard, for example. Um, you have a lot of things to input into your uh, various forms, and you only want to commit all that data into your DTO at the same time, not necessarily call the API of the DTO, the getters and setters, uh, every time some field value changes. So with buffering, what you can do is that on the field level, you fill the values into your UI components at first, and only at the end you call uh, commit, which will then automatically invoke the getters and setters of the corresponding uh, backing item bean, so the bean item in this case. Um, how that works is that within the browser, there is, for example, a text field with some value chains. It goes to the Vardin server side field, um, and the value is just remaining there. So it's not passed forward to anything else. Uh, then we have our browser again, where the user presses save button. What happens then is that we are getting a click event from our button, which we then handle in our uh, button click listener with, in our UI logic. And that UI logic invokes commit on the field or in the field group to commit multiple properties at the same time. And only then the field will commit this value into its backing bean data source. So that way you are able to cancel the changes in your UI. If, for example, the user presses cancel button, you don't have to fetch the data from the database again, but rather you only cancel it. And what happens is that from the property that you already have, the values are just sort of flushed back into your fields, which doesn't require you to fetch the values again from the database, convert, uh, like giving you some, some more resources. So field group is the utility that back in Vardin six times was called form. It's just the invisible utility that combines the fields into one item. So for example, we can have this kind of an editor with a couple name properties, some country, password, shoe size, birth date, whatever. And when I press apply, I would commit all the field values into my person item that has corresponding properties. If I pr press discard, that would just uh, discard the values and fetch them back from the person uh, item into the uh, actual fields. So without having to go back to database, go back to DTO layer to fetch data again, build the DTOs, just on the UI layer, cancel the changes with the discarding ability. Um, it works with set item data source, so the bean item that wraps, for example, the person automatically acquires its properties and is able then to pass these values into the bound fields of the uh, field group. Last question. What's the difference between these two method calls? Let's say we have a combo box and we have method set property data source to some property, and we have combo box set container data source into some container. Everybody, of course, knows this. 
you can have lunch immediately when you answer. Exactly. So uh, with the setting container data source, you are setting the items that are within your combo box from any kind of container, for example, from the lazy container. So if you have a combo box with a dropdown of 10,000 items, you want to load them lazily, but still through a container API. So with set container data source, you are able to bind the available items, while with set property data source, if the combo box is bound into some property, for example, in person you are able to select his occupation and you happen to have those 10,000 different options there, uh, then that selected occupation is stored into the person bean with this kind of property binding instead of doing with uh, get occupation, set occupation, pair of getters and setters. So, um, in general, um, lazy loading is a good thing to do. It's something that you are gonna wanna do and have to do if you have a lot of data just to preserve your backend resources. Um, Vardin gives you out of the box the communication between the UI server and the browser, so you don't have to care about that, but you will have to care about the backend resource management when you load a lot of resources from your backend data source into your UI. Um, best way or let's say at least recommended way in most of the cases <coughs> cases is to for example use the DTO approach uh, with DTOs what you have to care about is the conversion uh, don't make them one-to-one -one with the entities because it's just a waste of waste of effort to make customer DTO for a customer entity as that's just duplication of code but rather make that kind of customer listing that is able to give you all the customers uh, in more ordered fashion and lastly, um, let's say that, as I mentioned initially, when you are using, um, let's say, a CDI or dependency injection kind of approach, integration of these kind of services become as easy as using one EJB. So it's definitely a recommended approach if you are working with a Spring or CDI-enabled project to um, utilize all of its features, including the service and, let's say, converter auto-discovery. I think my time is up. Thank you, and let's have lunch.